The final section to be dealt with in this week, week 9, is section 9.3 that deals with minimum prices. Now, government can make it illegal to charge a price lower than the minimum price. Very often, this type of policy has very good intentions, like trying to support your agricultural products and farmers, or the minimum wage, for instance. But there are also adverse effects that we need to bear in mind. So let's look at the following analysis in figure 9.7. Now here you have your demand and supply curves. We have our price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. And the market clearing price and output would be P0 and Q0 respectively. So if government were to set a minimum price or a price floor, as you could call it, that would be a price that is set above the market clearing price, as you can see over here. So what would be the resultant impact of that? Well, first of all, producers would want to produce at Q2 because of the higher price that they could obtain. So that would result in the quantity supplied increasing from Q0 to Q2. However, on the other hand, if we have a look at consumers, by tracing the minimum price to a point on your demand curve, you can now see what the quantity demanded would be by consumers. And they will only purchase Q3, so therefore the quantity demanded by consumers has fallen from Q0 to Q3. As a result of this, there would be an excess supply because the quantity demanded at the minimum price is at Q3, but the quantity supplied producers would like to supply at Q2. But if producers were to realize that consumers would only buy Q3 and they were to only then supply this output Q3, then there would not be that excess supply or market surplus. However, there would still be a deadweight loss that would arise, as well as a loss to consumer surplus and producer surplus. So remember that your original consumer surplus would be given by this region. However, because of the minimum price, consumers would lose this rectangle to producers and it would form part of the producer surplus because there are consumers who would not purchase, given by this region, this triangle, they would not purchase any goods given this higher price. So this triangle would represent a deadwood loss to consumers. But at the same time, if this were the output that producers would supply to, because they knew that consumers would only purchase this amount, then producers would lose this triangle. So this would form part of the deadweight loss, as well as this triangle over here. And then this region becomes the producer surplus. So let's just have a look at the shadings, right? So that is the scenario if the producer were to respond and only supply this output. But what if the producer was not aware that the consumers would only purchase Q3? What if they were not aware of that and only responded by how much they would like to supply at this particular minimum price? And at this particular minimum price, they would want to supply Q2. This would result in an excess supply that is unsold between this region Q3 and Q2. So this shaded area D represents that excess supply that is unsold. Now, why is that the case? That is between Q3, Q3 and Q2. So remember, consumers will only purchase Q3. So producers would receive revenue 
for what is sold up until this point. However, they're going to receive no revenue to cover the cost of producing between this region over here. So this area under the supply curve gives the extra cost of producing each unit of output between Q3 and Q2. So this area gives you the cost of producing that particular quantity. However, no revenue is being collected to cover that cost. So what you find is that D now also becomes a loss to producer surplus. So if we are going to evaluate the changes to consumer surplus and producer surplus and then total surplus to see what eventually becomes the dead weight loss, we need to factor in this area D. So if we look at the change to consumer surplus, that's relatively easy. We know that the consumer surplus changed by minus A minus B. So minus A formed part of the consumer surplus, but that then was transferred to producer surplus because consumers had to pay this higher price. B was lost because of that higher price. Some consumers would not purchase the good at all because of their willingness to pay being lower than what that minimum price was. So minus A minus B represents the change in consumer surplus, right? Now, in terms of your producer surplus, this would have been your original producer surplus. However, as a result of this minimum price, producers gain rectangle A. However, triangle C was a deadweight loss to the producer, right? However, remember, Consumers only purchase Q3. So now as a result of that, this shaded area represents the cost of producing this quantity. However, it's not covered by the revenue. So this then makes the, the producers worse off. So now the change to producer surplus becomes positive A because they gained that. But minus C and minus d so in order for producers if they wanted to not find themselves reducing their profits they should then cut production lastly we'll look at this figure 9.8 that deals with the minimum wage so here is an example of a policy where a minimum price is being used so wages is now on your vertical axis and remember your wage represents the price of a factor of production which is labor and then on the horizontal axis you have labor or the number of workers that is being employed w0 is going to represent that that wage rate that clears the market and L0 is going to represent the number of workers that are employed at this particular wage rate, right? So now let's see what happens when there is a minimum wage. Now, a minimum wage is, of course, above that equilibrium wage rate, W0. So it is above that or higher than that wage rate. And as a result of that, firms are now not allowed to pay workers any less than w min so that's the minimum wage so what do you think would be the resultant effect on this particular market well some form of unemployment is going to result because the demand for labor now is going to fall from l0 to l1 so at this minimum wage, the demand for labor, as we can see on the demand curve, it has fallen to L1. However, at this higher wage rate, of course, the supply of labor is one going to increase to L2. So that difference between L1 and L2 represents some 
unemployment because the supply of labor at this wage rate is going to be L2. However, the demand for labor at this minimum wage is going to be L1. So there will be people who want to work but cannot find work at this higher wage, whereas those who were fortunate enough to find a job can now earn this higher wage rate. And again, you can evaluate the deadweight loss that would arise. So the deadweight loss again is going to be given by B and C. And those who supply the labor and were able to find employment would get this higher wage rate. And as a result, this then becomes a transfer to those who've supplied the labor. So they benefit by block A. However, there are those who are then unemployed. So there are benefits, but there are also those that would lose out. Lastly, there is an application on slide 15 and 16. So it looks at E-line regulation. Please read through this example to enhance your understanding and to see how you can use these tools in your analysis of particular policies. So that is slide 16. And we do not continue beyond this point because sections 9.4 to 9.6 will be covered in your third year. So we will conclude here.